Catholic Bible study group. Glad to see all of you get up uh, this morning so early. Uh, and uh, I'm going to see if we have any new ones here. Well, all right. So last week we started uh, a new series. Uh, the Marvelous Miracles in the Gospel of Mark. There's a couple of outlines left over there. If you weren't here last week, uh, take an outline. Actually, this is the second or third week. But let us begin with a little prayer this morning. And uh, of course, uh, our uh, church is getting rocked again uh, with uh, all kinds of issues. Uh, connected with clergy sex abuse and our Holy Father's calling a gathering of bishops, a couple of them. Uh, uh, so, and he personally has been under uh, fire. So, let us pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God our Father, prayer for the Pope. God our Father, you we ask you to look with mercy and love on your servant, Pope Francis, whom you have chosen to govern your church, shepherd your people. May he, through word and through example, direct, sustain, and encourage people in his care, so that with that he may share everlasting life in your kingdom and heaven. May the Lord preserve our Holy Father Francis, May he give him life, protect him in this life, and reserve him for the reward of the just. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, all right. So, last week, uh, we started off by giving a little background to miracles. Um, and, you know, I said, when you look across all the Gospels, and it's uh, particularly true in uh, the first Gospel, the oldest Gospel, the Gospel of Mark, the various miracles uh, can be broken down into different categories. So I said there's healing miracles, nature miracles, exorcisms, and summary miracles. <coughs> so, uh, we take, take a look at it, the healing miracles, of course, and people either with an illness, sickness, or disability, what we would call today a disability. Uh, nature miracles, these are miracles that would tend to uh, defy natural order. Miracles that defy uh, what you would expect uh, from nature. Exorcism, of course, uh, those who are possessed. Uh, and then summary miracles are sections where uh, they, the gospel writers would say, and all kinds of people came to Jesus and he cured uh, all of them or drove out demons and so on. So what we're going to look at today is we're going to look a little more specifically at uh, uh, in Mark. Uh, in our outline I have Jesus a miracle worker and a goat. So, Jesus as miracle worker now I'm not using gold as a derogatory term okay uh, but 
those of you who follow sports and so on, what does GOAT stand for? Greatest of all time. Greatest of all time. Greatest of all time. So, talking about Jesus as the greatest miracle worker of all time. So, uh, we start out by saying, you know, the miracle stories are integral to uh, the gospel narrative in Mark particularly. As a matter of fact, almost half of Jesus' public ministry, as presented in the Gospel of Mark, uh, are, filled, are miraculous. Uh, 425 verses in the Gospel of Mark, 200 of them deal with miraculous things, uh, happenings, events, and so on. You know, almost, almost half. Huh? Uh, all four evangelists, of course, include Jesus' wonderful works. And, of course, uh, we understand that Mark's Gospel being the oldest Gospel, and the first one it was used as a source, certainly by Matthew and Luke, uh, big chunks are taken uh, from Mark and found uh, almost word for word. Now, when you speak of, of uh, miracles and miracle working and so on, in the latter part of the 19th century, German uh, Bible scholars, Protestant Bible scholars, <coughs> led by a uh, theologian by the name of Boltmann uh, talked about and put forth uh, an analysis of scripture that was called the demythologizing the scriptures and looking at it with the uh, critical uh, uh, literary criti critical uh, form uh, they tried to explain away all the miracles and, and, and so on. Uh, really to no avail. <laughs> because even, even in the New Testament church afterwards, we find in St. Paul, uh, mir mir miraculous works were noted. Uh, miracles were taken for granted. But as what? And miracles were taken for granted as not oh you know you know we can't explain it any other way but as signs of God's power through Jesus that's what we have to note and keep in mind when we look at all the miracles they are signs of God's power through Jesus. And that's, uh, if we look at the context of some of the miracle stories and so on, that's, that's what you look for, and that's what we analyze. So, when we speak of Jesus as the miracle worker greatest of all time, first of all, it's a historical fact. It's, it's written in other secular histories, if you will, or writings from the first century in the ancient, uh, well, ancient. In the first century, Mediterranean world, Roman Empire, uh, healings particularly were important and they were always connected with religious phenomena. Healings were always connected with some kind of religious phenomena, which usually brought great uh, notoriety to the healers brought great. However, they were false healers. And we can find we put evidence of that in, even in the scripture. Uh, they were charlatans, they were magicians, some were sorcerers, some were occultists. And their stories in other New Testament writings, God in, in Acts, in Paul's letters and so on, of some of these individuals who are named. Really? Like who, Father? Really? 
seven deacons uh, leaves the Jerusalem church, goes out to Samaria and, and affects healings uh, through laying out of hands and using the name of Jesus. And this guy Simon comes up and sees that and wants to buy the powers. And, and, and they, uh, Philip goes back to, to uh, Jerusalem and, and Peter and John, I think, go up to Samaria and, and, and affect the, the same healing and so on. And Simon tries to buy their healing powers as if it's a magic trick. Okay? Um, there's a, another one. Uh, okay. Uh, you probably didn't hear about this guy. His name was Bar Jesus. In other words, son of Jesus, son of Joseph. He, he is called a sorcerer. Um, and um, he's connected uh, with the story. And he's also, uh, also called a false prophet. Where is that? that? I'm glad you asked. It's in Acts chapter 13. <laughs> Acts chapter 13. Uh, uh, verse 6 in the following verses. Um, and uh, when Paul and Barnabas are on their first uh, missionary journey, okay, and they go to the island of Cyprus, once they leave Antioch, uh, and so on, they go to I, and he's talking to the proconsul there. And this guy, Bar Jesus, is like a counselor to that Roman official, all right, and like a prophet. And, and, and so he, he too uh, tries to underscore uh, what, what Paul and Barnabas are trying to do. And then uh, Paul and Barnabas do a miraculous healing of somebody, and then all of a sudden this guy is like, uh, okay, you're fake, get out of here. All right. So, but Jesus, Jesus was an authentic miracle worker. And he does so <clears throat> publicly. And this is where the greatest of all time label can be placed on him, okay? Especially in medieval times. There's more miracle stories attributed to Jesus than any other figure in antiquity. More miracles attributed to Jesus of Nazareth than any other figure in antiquity. Uh, and that being said, in the Gospel of Mark, it's not like Jesus goes out and looks for that and looks for opportunities. Like, like someone who would be a fake. Like someone who would be a magician. Like someone who would be looking for the opportunity to make money off of doing magic tricks and sorcery and so on. Actually, in Mark, Jesus is, is portrayed as trying to avoid the attention. And we'll try to point, point that out as we look at some of the specific miracles. You know, there are sometimes after you know, doing a miracle and, and a healing, he'll tell the people, no, 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 don't go back to town. Don't tell anybody. Shh. What do we call that? In the Gospel of Mark, I talked about that. Shh. Messianic secret. Huh? Messianic secret. 
by golly, you still have it, Maureen. After 80 plus years, you still remember a few things. Okay, messianic secret in Mark. We're good. Yeah, you don't know what to do with it. I share it. So, the marking, marking gospel um, actually portrays Jesus as, as somewhat discouraging people. So, uh, even refuses to, sometimes refuses to do and show off his power. And that's in Mark chapter 8 and chapter 15. Uh, and one more thing I want to point out before we look specifically uh, in chapter 1. Uh, in the miracle summary statements that Mark has, Mark will say, and also many others were healed, or many others demons were cast out, and so on. The other synoptic gospels will say, and all were healed. So that's that's kind of putting kind of a tempering on the uh, the ministry uh, of Jesus. Now, and the reason why Mark wants to shift the emphasis toward the death of Jesus on the cross. That even the the goal, the greatest of all time miracle worker, cannot force faith, only trust in the power of Almighty God. So Jesus <coughs> is, is reflecting it, especially in Mark. Uh, on your outline, Roman numeral 4 it has miracles in Mark's Gospel, uh, and then begin by saying, Miracle is integral to Jesus' ministry as Mark portrays it in his gospel. Miracles are integral to Jesus' ministry uh, in Mark's gospel. But the focus of Jesus' theology, life, purpose, mission, ministry, the focus of in the Gospel of Mark, is not on miracles. It is on the Kingdom of God. Announcing the Kingdom of God. And, and, you know, take a look at the first verse, uh, Gospel of Mark, you know, open it up. But, you know, this is a Bible study. Let's look at the Bible. Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 1. In the, in the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God, or uh, some translations might have the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, putting Christ after Jesus' name is not Jesus of Nazareth. So uh, Mark as a gospel writer doesn't see Jesus of Nazareth simply as a man from Nazareth, uh, the son of a carpenter, his mother was Mary and had all kinds of other relatives. No. The Christ, that's a Christological term. That's not just a pun, okay? Uh, and for him to say the Son of God also is an indication. And then we look at verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. After John had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. Uh, this is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news, or believe in the gospel. This, these are the, the the first words. And you know, you know, you probably learned this in, in English or composition class. If you're going to write an essay or a story. You, you got to have a theme statement, right? You start with a theme statement. Well, this right here, highlighted in your Bible. This is Mark's theme statement for his whole gospel. And he puts it in the context of Jesus' first words. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. The kingdom of God is the centerpiece. Not miracle workers and not any other teaching. The kingdom of God. Everything focuses 
on the kingdom of God and all and, and through Jesus Christ, who is the crucified and risen one. So the other thing I, I want to point out, uh, because such a large amount of the Gospel of Mark, 200 out of the 425, uh, 425 verses, um, are devoted to healings and exorcisms, and yet that is to balance Jesus' teachings in words of Jesus. It's actually to balance it. Uh, but in the way the way Mark lays out his gospel, both his miracles and his teachings all lead up to the cross, and the crucifixion, his death and resurrection. And it's kind of, kind of interesting this morning, if you go to daily mass uh, this morning or today, we celebrate the, the feast of the exaltation of the cross with uh, special scripture readings and so on. So it's, it's kind of fitting that I, I'm talking about this today. Huh? Hope it'll give you the feeling if you want to go to Mass. Okay. We sing special songs. All right. Uh, without, without the cross, Mark's portrait of Jesus as a wonder worker and, and even teacher is unbalanced. It doesn't have a, a guiding or directive principle. It doesn't have, not just the story about Jesus of Nazareth, but his whole ministry and, and message and mission, purpose, if you will, doesn't have that that directing uh, principle. Now, section B, point B, on the outline would, would have Jesus' power moves against Satan. And we look, uh, what follows in the Gospel of Mark is, uh, starting from, oh, verse 16 actually, uh, not so much this, but it's, it's set up. Mark lays this out that Jesus has a very eventful day. And he presents it as, a, as a, all in one day. It's, a, it's unbelievable. So first of all, he has Jesus passing by the Sea of Galilee. I'm looking at verse 16. Uh, as he passed by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting their nets. They were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they abandoned their nets and followed him. And he walked along a little further and saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They too were in the boat mending their nets. And they, he, then he called them. And so they left their father Zebedee in the boat along with the hired men and followed him. Now, some might say, okay, this is almost like the first miracle uh, that they leave everything and follow him, you know, uh, just by his words, huh? Uh, Make no mistake about it. Peter and Andrew particularly, they weren't just fishermen. They weren't just fishermen. They were businessmen. They didn't have marketing directors, okay? They, didn't, they had hired people to clean the fish, which is a good idea. I mean, you go fishing with your grandkids. Why? To teach them the enjoyment of fishing? and to teach them how to use a knife and clean those fish. Right? right? If you're smart, you will. <laughs> That's what your dad did. Okay. How to use a sharp knife and clean the fish. Yeah, and all the, you, because, you know, trying to eat fish with the gut still in them, that's not too good. Yeah. Scale of it, yeah. So, but he, he, he caught the, the fishermen first, and it, some might say, well, this is almost like the first miracle, but it doesn't fall into any of these categories, does it? So, um, so why, why does he have this? Well, um, the statement of Jesus, I will make you fishers of men, that's actually a metaphor. Okay? So he takes people whose, whose profession, whose profession 
is fishing, and it's, it, it, folks, this isn't a rod and reel kind of sport fishing kind of stuff. This is commercial. Huh? Okay, nets, mending the net of God. And what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the power, divine power, the power of God over the kingdom of Satan, over the kingdom of evil. So if this person indeed was possessed by a demon, and the demons are shouting out, I know who you are. And does it say? Yeah. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Notice the phrase that the demon used would be the human identification of who Jesus was. He is like, Jesus of Nazareth. Have you come to destroy it? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Come out of him. Get out of here. Get quiet. Uh, the demon, or the spirit, evil spirit, not only knows Jesus, but fears Jesus. And so the power and authority is seen here. And, you know, arguably this is like the first miracle in the Gospel of Mark. Okay? The first miracle. Don? It says, <clears throat> from that point on, his reputation spread. That's when the crowd started telling how effective would he have been without miracles. How effective? Well, I think he, he would have been effective uh, nonetheless. Uh, but it's a good question with, without the, the miracle. It, and it, look, it's interesting that this, the first miracle as presented in Mark, where does it happen? Not only in Capernaum, but but where? In a synagogue. Okay? In the Jewish synagogue. It didn't happen in the pagan temple uh, that was uh, built by the Romans just north of town. Uh, Capernaum had a garrison of Roman officers. Later on in the Gospel accounts, the, the head of the Roman uh, Roman official will come and say, you know, will you come and, and lay your hands on my son or my servant who was dying and so on. And he was from Capernaum. So there was there was a, a garrison and so on. But it, make, it makes the point it was in the context of the Jewish synagogue at that time. It affirms that Jesus was a practicing Jew. All right. Secondly, uh, that most of the population that were Jewish in Capernaum and some scholars figure uh, maybe 50% or less were Jews in Capernaum at that time. Because Capernaum was uh, a main crosswords, from, a cross road for the, the merchant routes coming from Damascus and so on, and then going out to the to the Mediterranean shore. It's right out of the way. That's why they had a tax collecting business there. Who oh, Jesus was going to recruit one of those guys too, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, time into what Tom just asked. Other than uh, miracles, we keep reading that he spoke with authority. What was that authority that brought the people to him? Uh, I'll bet the, the miracles, they still wanted to listen to him, they believed in him. What was the difference in this man versus the scribes who may be talking? Okay, let's start just with your first question and so on. Yeah. Okay, what was the, the authority that he, he spoke with? And that was the first thing that was presented here that amazed the crowd. And, uh, and it says, not like the scribes. Okay. So, unlike our our understanding and our vision, since most of us as Catholics were raised with, okay, you have a parish and you have your parish priest, and your parish priest is, you know, schooled up in theology, and so he's the religion. And in this day and age, you know, you probably have to share your parish priest with another parish or another parish or another parish, <laughs> and so on. And, uh, uh, okay. Uh, and many of you have deacons as well, uh, you know, like Grandpa Maury back there. 
So a deacon, you know, but there is a, a difference when a deacon preaches. You understand, you know, okay, but it, you know, he, he has a, some background, but it's not like a priest. Not not the same as the authority. So Jewish synagogues and services, especially in the first century, were different than that. So and as long as you had twelve bar mitzvah men who went through bar mitzvah. Uh, any one of those could get up in a synagogue service and, and you know, give a reflection, and, as we would call them, and so on. Uh, if they had, if it was a big synagogue that was well endowed, maybe they had someone who was a scribe, a religious, a scribe who wasn't just someone who wrote, he wasn't a secretary or so on, all right? He was someone who had some schooling in theology. And if the scribes taught, they would refer to who the rabbi was or the rabbinical school they heard this teaching from. There were only two rabbinical school, main rabbinical schools in Palestine at that time. Rabbi Shammai and Rabbi Hillel, and they were both centered in Jerusalem. Okay, and they both both took a different form of interpretation of the Jewish law. So, but but the the scribes who would teach or who would put forth, or those uh, uh, the, the lay people, if you would, or the Jewish men who would get up and, and talk. They would say, as I heard from a rabbi, a scribe so-and-so, who was trained by Rabbi Shammai or Rabbi Hillel, this is what we should understand about that. Jesus did not do that. He spoke, okay, he asked, what authority? In his teaching, his authority came from him. Yeah. It was all his own insight. And he, uses, he used that marvelous form of parables, mostly to the crowds. And that's what was so attractive to him. Now, Think of the power of that man to do that and to be able to have and draw upon that. Uh, yeah. Thinking as a writer, but, uh, I didn't write just because of me. I wrote because of what was coming to me and then paraphrasing it again. Yeah. So, uh, but it, as, as Tom started out uh, with his insight, all of a sudden, it is it word spread throughout Galilee. Okay, uh, and the thing is, if it was a Sabbath, and uh, most of the Jews of the area of Capernaum were in the at that time, in the, and they heard about this Jesus of Nazareth and the way he taught, and then surprisingly, during that service, all of a sudden. This guy gets up, you know, and, and you know he shouts out, and what he shouts out, I know where you are, the Holy One of God, and he said, "Be quiet, get, get out of here," and everything calmed down. I mean, of course, everyone's going to be amazed, but note the order. Yes. Note the order. They were amazed first at his teaching, right? And his teaching in the center. And then secondly, they were amazed by this whole exorcism, you know, business with the demon and so on. I mean, it, it was uh, quite a, an explosion. And then, and then afterwards, uh, evidently Peter says, uh, Jesus, come to my house after synagogue service. Mother-in-law is over there. She, she, she's preparing lunch. You got synagogue lunch, you know. So they, they go and they find his mother-in-law sick. That's the next thing. Huh? And what is Jesus? Well, let's take a look at that. So on leaving the synagogue, he enters the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Notice the four that he recruited as witnesses. Simon's mother-in-law lay sick with a fever. And they immediately told him about her. He approached, grasped her hand, helped her up. And then the fever left her. 
and she waited on him. So, now, this sets kind of a pattern for other healings. Let me point out to you, it sets a pattern for other healings. And there's three steps. Number one, the condition is given and described. The condition is given and described. Uh, she's, she's evidently flattened bed and she has a fever. Oh, what, what exactly that fever is? They don't ask that kind of question. You know, it, it's not a medical report. <laughs> it could be almost anything, right, Doc? <laughs> okay. So, she, <laughs> Careful, Mark. Okay, stick with fever. Next, what does Jesus do what, to heal? First of all, even before that, his, his new, newly recruited disciples come and tell him. So someone who is connected with the person who's ill or sick comes as an advocate for them. And that person who comes, or persons who come to Jesus, have already some kind of connection, relationship, trust in what Jesus could do for them, for their loved one. Okay. And here, what is Jesus? He doesn't always do this, but he he reaches out and grasps her by the hand. And when it says he, he, he helped her up or raised her up, and here, I want to point out something. There, there, the Greek word that's translated here kind of, kind of you know, loosely in the, in the poor English, uh, helped her up. The Greek word, ejirio, uh, means like being raised from the dead. It's, a, it's the same word that's used for the root word for resurrection, basically. Being raised up from basically the dead. Okay? And so it's not just, oh, he helped her get out of bed. No, no. The, the word that is used, I mean, she's like deathly sick. And he gives her to new life. He gives her new life. And then, so, condition is described. Jesus comes because he's brought by a loved one and caregiver. Third is the results of the healing. She was healed to such an extent that she began to do hospitality, began to serve. You know, and, and if we cross-reference that, to, like in the Gospel of uh, John and Jesus, uh, uh, good friends Martha and Mary, Probably it's the same word that's used for Martha and Martha's complaint about her sister Mary not helping, helping to serve the apostles. So today, someone to pray for uh, someone is it important to know their name um, uh, if you know it you know be specific yes um, it's not important to God because God knows everything okay. but the, the, the advocacy of prayer the, for, for divine healing, for divine intervention in the case of, of, of this particular person. Okay. And on, on the other hand, Delaine, stop to think. 
anyone who who asks you because they know you're a good, you know, Christian woman and, and, and you know, go to church all the time, go to Bible study on Friday morning, you know, and, and like a crazy person at 6.30 in the morning, uh, that, you know, so they come to you, they come to you because they feel they want additional support because they recognize in you someone who they trust in terms of their faithfulness to God. Someone with authority. Well, in a sense, that uh, it's, it's more not so much authority, Roy. It's someone with relationship with God. Okay. I'm and trying it, to make that yeah, distinction. It goes, it goes back to relationship with God. Okay. So if you know it, you put it down. Uh, a number of our parishes have parish intention books off to the side, you know, to put down. Specifically, if you know who the ill person is, and a lot of times it's helpful to have there. And a lot of parishes have prayer teams and so on that will look at that and, and you know, pray or have uh, prayer teams that will take that up and, and pray for it. So it's, it's everything. And, you know, you know, you know, some of our Protestant brothers and sisters say, oh, you're Catholic, why do you pray to Mary and pray to saints and so on? Well, what's the difference between that and, and the scenario you just put up? Here on earth, we ask other people to pray, right, to God for those who are sick or ill or, you know, going through the crisis and so on. So, What's the difference between that and us advocating the intercession of those who are saints, who the church has canonized and says they are in heaven with God now, and us, you know, turning to them, and every saint is a patron of something, okay? Uh, you've got friends or relatives who are coming down with cancer and so on, and they say, pray for me. I need to hear you say, I will I'll pray to Saint, uh, I'll start a novena or to Saint Peregrini, patron saint of those with cancer. Okay? So, you know, and, and you know, our Protestant brothers and sisters should not downplay us praying to saints and particularly Jesus' mother because uh, we, as Roman Catholics, believe she's by adoption and through our baptism. It, She's mother of the church. Jesus gave her at the foot of the cross, you know, uh, to not just John or that odd name, actually, disciple at the foot of the cross, but to all of us. She's mother of the church as well. So it's, it's all right, and it's good, and it's proper. And if you know the condition and the person, to use them by name, okay? All right. Any, anything else? Long answer to you know any, a good question. Okay. Uh, so this this miracle of raising up the mother uh, is really a symbolic act, but it's not so much a symbolic act of healing to Peter's mother-in-law, but I think it's a symbolic portrait of a believer, and your question tonight is like perfect for it, as a, a, an advocate. Simon Peter was an advocate. Now, you know, let's face it, there are some sons-in-laws that if their mother-in-law was sick, wouldn't be praying that they get healed. That's, that's what I understand. I heard the young Joseph. Okay. And, and, and those of you who are uh, mother-in-laws, you know, uh, you know, be careful about that interrelationship, okay? Uh, so that you're not one of those mother-in-laws, but rather a mother-in-law who your son-in-law would go to Almighty God and pray that you would be healed, maybe in more ways than one. <laughs> So, yeah, certainly I'm joking, but also making a point. So, here's the thing. The reign of God is now present. It becomes a present reality. 
because Jesus now has raised up someone where before the witnesses, four witnesses of, according to Mark, the first four recruited disciples of him. Uh, and now that person who has been healed and raised up, what about that mother-in-law? She now is healed to such an extent she has the ability to serve. Who did she serve? She served the one through whom she was perceived to have been healed. Now, this section ends with uh, verse 32. And when it was evening, after sunset, they brought to him all who were ill, or many who were ill, and possessed by demons. And the whole town was gathered at the door, and he cured many. He cured many. He notice, he didn't cure all. He cured many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons, not permitting them to speak because they knew him. Oh, quite an eventful day, huh? Quite, I mean, unbelievable. And, and you know, I, I, I try to put it with maybe some exaggerated dramatics here this morning. But I want to convey to you there's a lot of emotional going on here. There's a lot of energy going on here, right? I, 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 Peter and Simon, James and John, you know, they must have been. What a day. You know. And so, you know, if, if you continue to read, you find out that they can't find Jesus the next morning. No, he was coming. Because he went off. He went out of town. He went off to a deserted place, you know, to, 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 to recruit. And he indicated to them, uh, no, 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 we're going to go to the other villages and cities around the circuit. Okay. Michael? Uh, that seems to be two days, though, because the, they were working on their nets. Was that the end of the synagogue? Uh, a good point. I was going to make that as a point. But, <laughs> but thank you very much for bringing that insight up. Yeah, yeah. yeah because, because as, as Jews, religious Jews, they wouldn't be working on the set. But they pulled their nets and they were cleaning and mending the nets when Jesus recruited them, which means that they would have taken off the next day. They would have taken off the next day. So the next day would have been the Sabbath day. But still, as he... So, uh, basically, there's an explosion uh, there's an explosion of ministry that happens as Mark portrays Jesus beginning his public ministry. And it was so exhausting that the next day they can't find him because Jesus has to get out of town. And so, here we have a number of miracles. First eventful day of Jesus, the powerful ministry, or maybe the second, okay, um, and we've covered already healings, exorcism, and summary healings and ministries. So we have more miracles to see. So I to look at. So I hope you come back again and bring some others. Thank you very much for coming this morning.